Well, we have to consider that not only IVF lab, but all the processes related with assisted reproduction, because at the end it's uh, are, are come to get together. So probably the most difficult is our self retrieval that is still is very manual, but uh, related with the IVF lab, probably the nudation is something that uh, still is very manual, can be uh, automated, but I think it's not uh, easy to connect with the other processes in the IVF lab. I think that uh, to lose a personal or professional skills in IVF lab is a personal decision. So you have to maintain a, a level, and even, for example, the pilots, so they, don't, they don't pilot the, the, the plane, but they need to do the landing, they need to do everything, even with most of the processes are absolutely automated. So I think it's the same in the lab. Uh, they need, we need to uh, have machines that to do the work, but we need to supervise the machines to, to, to check that the work is well done. And of course, if something happens with the machines, we need to know how to do manually everything. Automation and humanization, dehumanization in the IBF lab. And this is the disclosure um, about the companies I, I work, most of them not related with this talk. And first is uh, to talk about robots. We robots are in, in our life every day. And uh, there is a conflict or not with robots and humans because at the end we have to uh, survive and live with them. There are some uh, processes in, the, in, the, uh, in every part of our life that is, are completely automated, but I think we have to distinguish between those uh, processes that are automated and they don't need, mainly, they almost don't need uh, the uh, supervision of, uh, of humans, like in the industry of cars and others, but in many others, it's totally necessary the supervision of one person. So I don't think that in IBF, Embryology Lab, Embryology Lab, and also in the, in the, the office of the gynecologist, that the robots or automation is going to, to really to be a conflict uh, to work every day. In fact, we are not uh, concerned about where we fly every, every week, every month, who actually pilots the plane? And the answer is, who cares? So you feel really safe when you are in the plane, and you, are really, you feel really safe when you are landing with fog, when it is completely automated in many airports. So this is happening every day, and nobody is uh, concerned about that. About Tesla that was mentioned before, even this automation, uh, requires the, the supervision of the men, of the driver. And in fact, in the, when you uh, drive the, the Tesla, they say that you have to have your hands on the wheel while the conduction is completely automated. So, but in the IBF lab, okay now. This is the paper in 2021 in which uh, Adashi and uh, Gary Smith also and Kashmir, Kashmir, they, they talk about the automation and mini miniaturization of the IBF lab. About IBF lab, there are many, many different processes that can be automated. Not, not, not all of them can be automated, but most of them they can, they can be automated, mainly the sperm selection, the fertilization, embryo culture, embryo selection for transfer, but of course, cryopreservation. So why automation? First, because increase, the increase in, in infertility worldwide, the increased demand, not enough supply. The process is mostly, mostly manual in every process in the lab. The data is kept in silos, in clinics, making analysis difficult. And because there is an increase in the age of maternity, here you can see how uh, the increase of maternity in black in 1970s to 2000, and now 2020, in which the age of the maternity is increased a lot. So it, may, it means that uh, it, we are going to have more work in the future than we have now. In, in fact, 
we have the double of cycle in 10 years since 2012. So it means there are not enough reproductive endocrinologists training. There is not enough expert embryologists, but it depends on the country. But for example, in Spain, we need ER, but we have, we need ER, but we have uh, an excess of en embryologists. So the clinics, they need the ER. They are not enough ER, but they, they have a, overbooking of an embryologist in the lab. So at the end, uh, the qualification of the professionals results in expensive IVF treatment. So what's happened with, uh, with the manual processes? Mainly that there is a lot of variability between IVF center. This is clear. And this is not, not, not only depending on the technology because in Spain, in my case, in our case, the technology, I mean, the technology means if you have an embryoscope or not, if you have a, 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 an incubator or other, or if you have good or, or bad embryologists, the aneuploidy rates at the end in egg donors is vary from 20% to 60% depending on the center. And the pregnancy rates uh, in the world, but also you can see this in Spain, vary from 10% to 80% depending on the center. At the end, the method and the skill level vary from center to center, operator to operator. This is an example of the, an example of the differences in PGT uh, published by Santiago Monet a few years ago, over thousands of, of embryos, in which there are 42 uh, centers with a, a nuclear average of 30% in donors, but with a variation, a range of a nuclear since 18% to 60%, depending on the center. And these differences can be also shown in the same center in different doctors having the same embryology lab. This is a graphic that uh, was, uh, they give uh, the, the Obo Bank in Spain, they produce and sell thousands of oocytes to many clinics. And this is the differences between the warming and the survival of oocytes in different centers. The same oocytes from same donors in different centers. In different centers, you have uh, some clinics that they have a survival rate of 40%, 42, and some of them they have a 100% using the same exactly kit of Kitasato in this case. So it means that the protocols are not well done in all the places. And this is part of the, uh, the result of the manual use of, of the protocol. And the same also is in the embryology lab. Everything, most of them is manual. Paper team preparing this is uh, the use of the micro manipulator or the uh, loading of the oocytes of the embryo in the straws but also the gynecologist, because the gynecologists based in their experience, their hormone stimulation. So they, there is, not a, there is a, a protocol, a standard protocol for the clinic, but they have to personalize in different patients due to their own experience of the clinic and their own embryology. And also the peak of the eggs is something that they learn with the, with the, with the years. So, is the solution for the standardize the results and to standardize the IVF or cl clinical uh, outcomes, the automation could be in some of the processes. So what automation can provide in theory? Same results in every center, every time, uh, in the labor is a major cost of the IVF center. So there is a worldwide shortage of expert embryologists. Convenience, monitor at home or perform in the ob gym office. Infinite data, machines will share information versus one team experience. And finally, platform. This platform gives us a baseline from where to innovate faster. Why now, not now, a few years ago, this is possible? 
because we have affordable robotics with high precision and miniaturization, software that are making robots the new smartphone, the microfluidics. We have microfluidics for many years, but now we are applying microfluidics to IVF. Artificial intelligence is one of the topics that is also in this conference, and the IoT. What we are already automating the lab. Hormone dosing, there are several software programs that determine the hormones and the dosage and to have the best, the best clinical outcomes. Experience selection by macrofluidics, witness systems, time-lapse incubator, probably this is the point in which we have developed the best uh, machines to automate the embryo development. I, I think that you, uh, 20 years ago, couldn't consider that you can leave the embryo for uh, a lot of time without watching every day to have a picture and to detect uh, uh, the morphology and to uh, evaluate the embryo. Embryo beautification, even that uh, some of them are not, go not working now, but they have been developed to help the embryologists at the lab in embryo beautification and the automate sample A storage, and you know, everybody knows tomorrow. What is being now automated? I'm going to mention all of them, but I'm going to talk about a few of them. Automate ultrasound reading, outside retrieval, automate this preparation, automate denudation, egg and embryo vitrification and warming, ICSI, embryo selection by AI and artificial uterus. AI for follicular scanning, cycle clarity. This is the way how it measures the number of follicles and the size of the follicles in an automated way. So in few seconds, you have all the follicles measured and the difference with the manual uh, or the human uh, work is the reduction in time more than 96%. So from 10 minutes to 0.3 minutes. And not only is a question of time, it's a question of quality, because there are less differences among the different operator. Here you have the differences in the, from 2.3 millimeters to 0.2 millimeters, depending uh, in an automated way. And you can do at home. The second is the outside retrieval by uterine lavage uh, without surgery or anesthesia. This is something uh, still is developing, is in the process of being developed by Butterfly here in the US, here in California. And mainly they have developed an intrauterine lavage system with the idea of facilitating to the doctor the collection of the oocytes uh, with uh, less invasive uh, intervention. So in less than 10 minutes, you can obtain or uh, get all the oocytes that are already um, that are in the, in the tubal with the minimal discomfort without anesthesia. And it was proved uh, first to collect embryos that were, uh, were conceived, were fertilized, fertilized in vivo to do the PGD, collecting the embryos in the tubal and then in the uterus and after to be transferred to the embryo, to the uterus. So the idea of this device, of this new methodology of uh, the end is not totally automated, but it's facilitating the automation of oocyte retrieval, is to collect without any, um, without using the, any function by, by the service, to collect all the oocytes from the uterus and the tubal to do uh, whatever, you are going to do to freeze or to do genetic testing or to freeze. This has a lot of advantage. Maybe there is no surgery. You don't need the operation room. It's cheaper per egg. And you can use also fever drugs. And you have less discomfort. And mainly, you don't need anesthesia. The next is automate egg denudation. There are several uh, developments in the in processes, uh, one of them uh, we are involved, the third one of Guerrero is uh, being developed in Overture Life with uh, Associate Santiago Monet. And mainly, 
probably this is one of the processes more manual that exist in embryology. It's really uh, hard to see how you are pushing the pipe, pipetting, pipetting until you get the oocyte uh, completely denude. So it's exposed to changes of temperature. Uh, you can expose to an excessive time of chemical by another days, and also uh, the fluidic and, and to share stress. So there are several uh, development in the market or in the development. First is uh, by microchannels. There are other by ultrasonic microfluidic devices and robotic devices with good results in mice, similar post-denudation, survival, fertilization, blastulation in mice, and also in, with the robotic device, uh, good results in denudation, a blastocyst rate. In Overture, we are working with a, a open well egg denudation device or robotic by microfluidics, in which what we do is uh, uh, pull and push uh, liquid until we get all the cumulus cells uh, out of the oocyte. This is a one well, this is a, the first uh, prototype in one well, but we can do this also in a bigger machine doing all the oocytes at the same time. Here you can see how from one well to the other at the same time, this uh, had been done with uh, mice, but also with, uh, with human oocytes. Here you can see the same device, you can load until 18, uh, 16 eggs at the same time to do the denudation. The next one is the automated egg and embryo vitrification and warming, and probably the more advanced uh, development in uh, overture life where we are uh, where we are working, and in which we have developed this uh, machine that is very small. I want to show a small video, uh, a short video, to see how how small it is and how it works. And mainly there is a biochip uh, device that is inserted in the. In, the, in this machine and everything is done automatically. So there is, this device contains two reservoirs for the media and in the, uh, at the bottom there are many micro channels. What are we doing is to mix the different um, ES and VS media to do a gradient of, for, the, for the vitrification. So it's, in theory it's going to avoid uh, osmotic shocks in the, in the oocytes. I'm going to shoot this video for you to understand that there is a small machine. Still, we are doing the, the clinical trials. So what we have, to, we have demonstrated in mice and we have demonstrated in bovine, we need to, be, uh, to demonstrate in human. So we, mainly what we are doing is uh, um, clinical trials in Argentina and Mexico to have at the end results of blastocyst rate that are similar, should be similar to, to the manually. So after you do the, um, you fill first with the different, the two reservoirs with the media, the system, what it's doing is to fill uh, all the microfluidics until, and to fill the, the, the pool. And after the priming, you can take three minutes in total. You can put the oocytes or the embryos and the system is mixing the media. So that you can load the embryo. This is machine is using also for warming and for freezing, for both. The only thing that you can do, you have to do manually, of course, is to load, to load the embryos or to, do the, to load the oocytes under microscope. So the machine is really very, very small. And in 13 minutes, it's finished. The second thing that uh, we have developed, it's a, a new methodology for storing the, the oocytes on the embryo in a also very single way, because if not, you have to, at the end, you have to have the skill to upload to load the, the embryo or the oocytes in the straw. And this is a, we have called piccolo, that is basically is taking the embryos or the oocyte in a direct way and we freeze them.
So these are the, the first results, are not the first results, the last results we have, and we have the results in the blastocyst rate and all the, in the different process, we have a very similar result that, that the vitrification, the manual vitrification. Now we are doing a, a test, I mean a clinical trial, in which with uh, uh, 94 egg donors, we are dividing the eggs and doing manually and doing, um, and doing with the da vitri. And what we expect is to have a pregnancy rate uh, standard that we have or has been published in SART. And the final uh, automation that is probably the most interesting today is the ICSI. Uh, this is a, has been developed in Barcelona and Santi Monet, in fact, is a director of this project inside Overture. And mainly what we have developed is an automatic ICSI. I'm not going to show the video because it's too long, but mainly what he's doing is a known, a person that are not, is not expert of, uh, in embryology can manage uh, the, the XCA, XC Automate, and to do the, the, um, the X in an automate way. And we have done this in Hamster with similar results in survival rate and, uh, and two hours overnight. We have similar results. I don't know why the numbers are, or the presentation is changing the numbers, but mainly in Hamster, in Rabbit, survival, cleavage, and blastocyst rate are very similar. We uh, moved to mouse model with similar results also. And finally, we went to human, in which we have very good results on survival fertilization and expanded blastocyst. However, we have a difference between euploidy and aneuploidy. And uh, we don't know why, but probably it's, the, it's, uh, it's due to the um, non uh, expert, non, uh, the skill of, of non expertise of the uh, manipulator because it's not a, an embryologist, it's another person that can select the, the sperm. But in any case, we had in the, the first baby born a few months ago uh, in, with a new hope fertility in New York, and it was also the price of SRBT price in, uh, in 2022 and this was the first baby who was born uh, two or three months ago. Finally, I want to mention that uh, automation not only uh, should be done with, uh, with all the, the processes in IVF, but also in the embryo selection. The embryo biopsy, I think now PGT, PGTA, PGT, non-invasive PGT metabolomics is something that we have to uh, uh, implement in our lab. In an automated way means to collect the media and to have everything down in a laboratory, external laboratory. So we want to pass from one to the other, mainly to metabolomics from here to here, and also adding the AI to the selection of embryo. In conclusion, only to say that automation is irreversible in IVF lab as in other fields in medicine and in our life, that there are some processes that are difficult to automate in IVF, not impossible, but difficult, that uh, they are going to standardize the clinical results, that they are going to reduce errors in the IVF lab, and you all recognize that all we have a bad day. An assisted reproduction professional will be happier, this is what we want, and they will have more time for research and personal development, and finally, that the loss of technical skill will be an election of the person. Thank you very much for your attention.